Good morning. So the chief's fan went up to a pastor, said, Pastor, you just got to pray for our chiefs so they win the Super Bowl. And the pastor said, well, my son, that won't work. And he goes, well, why not? He said, what if God's an Eagles fan? <laughs> so, have any visitors? No visitors? Oh, there we go. <laughs> any other visitors? Any joys? Good. Congratulations, Darren. And uh, Darren and, is it Ethan? Their team went undefeated this year. So in basketball, third grade basketball. So Very good. They did, an out, they did an outstanding job. Gary, a joy that uh, some people may have heard about, some may not have, but the worship service down at Asbury in Kentucky, one of our seminaries, or Asbury College, it started on Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock, and I haven't heard for sure, but uh, to my knowledge, has not stopped. Uh, there's a move, moving of the Holy Spirit down there, and they've been praying and, and worshiping continuously. Someone has been in that chapel worshiping and praying since Wednesday at 10 a.m. in the morning. Uh, and there have been great revivals that Asbury kind of kicked off back in the 50s and back in the 60s that it spread across the nation and this has gone out to Ohio and, and all kinds of places already people are coming, traveling from all over to come into Asbury local people are coming in for prayer I know for what they posted and I, I've seen and I'm sure there's more that at least six or, or at least eight people have given their lives to Christ during this time but I'm sure that's that there's a lot more but a lot of us have been praying for revival in this nation for quite some time. In fact, Rob Schmutz, uh, one of the guys that's come yeah. and filled our pulpit several times and did our revival here a while back, requested that we pray a prayer for revival in this nation at 316 every, every morning oh. and, or every afternoon. And so uh, we may be seeing God's answer to that prayer, but there's a movie about the time it happened in the 1970s that's coming out this month here in a couple weeks on February 24th. And so um, it seems like God may have brought everything together for a, a particular time and a particular moment. I don't know. Good. But yeah, it is a joy that they have been worshiping. And this, is, this started off with young <clears throat> students. They're Asbury students who decided to stay after worship and continue singing and praying. And it never was, they never yeah. left, and it seemed to have caught fire and drawn people in from all around. Good. Praise the Lord. And uh, well, we want to welcome Jason here this morning. Thanks for joining us. Any other joys? We had a little joy last, last okay. Sunday. We went and visited a cave and a different church. Oh, good. That's right. good. Any, any other joys? Okay, we'll go to announcements. <clears throat> the Ebenezer Prayer people, persons this week is Heather and Chris Boland family. That's who we'll be praying for. Janitors for Jesus are needed, so if you're interested in helping, you want to help, you, you can sign up. There's a bulletin at the back. Supply drive, the ladies fellowship is doing a supply drive at the fellowship, fellowship excuse me, at the fellowship hall. And uh, there's a list on the bulletin board of things they need. Donna posted it back there so you can look and see what we need. Monday, February, tomorrow night is the Bible study before the, the Merle and Joan over at the hall. And they're in Romans 5. Tuesday, February 13th is All God's Children at 325. Wednesday, February the 15th at 630, the youth group is going to host a Valentine's Day dinner at church. And for tic tickets, uh, contact Andy or Colton. Terry, today's the last day to get tickets, so run it to me after church if you guys want one. If you want one, get a hold of him. Today's the last day. Okay. 
And it's for a good cause. It's for the youth, right, Colton? Yes, sir. For the youth. So it's for a good cause. So get your tickets. Friday, February 17th at 6 is the Winter Jam 2023 Interest Bank Arena at Wichita. Saturday, February the 18th is the Men's Fellowship Breakfast. Tuesday, February the 21st at 6.30 is the Ladies' Fellowship Meeting. Wednesday, February 22nd at 7.30 is Ash Wednesday Service. 5 p.m. at Opium, 6.30 out at Madison and 7.30 out here at the church. Friday, February the 24th, the movie Jesus Revolution is playing in Emporia b, &B Theaters. The movie follows Greg Glory and the Jesus movement that happened at Cravelly Chapel in California. Wednesday, March the 1st at 6.30 is Lent Bible Study at Opie and on Zoom. March 10th to the 12th is the Women's Encounter at the Cross. Tuesday, March 16th at 7 is Casting Crowns, Hartman Arena, Park City, Kansas. April 21st to the 23rd is a men's encounter at the cross. Friday, April 21st at 7, Zach Williams, Oprah Theater at Wichita, Kansas. And Friday, April 28th at 7 for King and Country, Hartman Arena in Park City, Kansas. Is there any other announcements anybody wants to add to them? Uh, Terry, did you say that OP Church is going to have a dinner next Saturday? Yeah, next Saturday night. Yeah, the, the ladies in there are hosting a German, German theme uh, dinner. So if you want to join them in there, it starts at 5, I think at 5 o'clock. Terry, we'll have the third Sunday party practice. Right after church today? Okay. Any other announcements? Any birthdays? Dixie had one last week. Yep, Dixie did. Any others? No. Nope. We'll, we'll sing happy birthday to Dixie. Happy birthday to you. No anniversaries. We'll have the children's message. Okay. Look what I have here. What do you think this is, Duckling? It's a mare. It is a mailbox. What's on it? A heart. It does have a heart on it. Okay, do you guys know what holiday is coming up? What holiday is coming up? All right, and Coulter, what do you do when we have Valentine's Day? What do we do at school? Um, you make a Valentine's box and you give other Yeah, you can make things. So this was a Valentine that I got one time. You guys see what it says? So do you guys give a little Valentine's like that? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, you can kind of give different little Valentines like that. Like that one. Okay, but I'm going to show you the greatest Valentine that I have ever received. Are you guys ready to see what it is? Okay, it fits in this box or in this little mailbox. Okay, here's the greatest Valentine that I have ever received. What's that? The cross. It is a cross. I can turn it around like that, and it's just a cross, isn't it? Now, why would you think? I would like a cross over something like that. Can you go sit down, Ben? Why do you think that? Because it was on that side. It's up here at church, isn't it, Declan? We see the cross quite a bit up here at church. This is kind of pretty. It's got some decorations on it. But yeah, what happened on this cross? Yeah. And you know what that makes me think of? That yeah. makes me think of the greatest love that I've ever known. Yeah. So yeah, we always think about Valentine's Day and we think about love, don't we? But yeah, that's pretty. And, and what else? My mama always get me some toys to share. Does she mom. get you some toys too? Awesome. Yeah. And so with me to play with with Ben Man. Yeah, awesome. And I have a cross. Okay, well I am. I'm gonna show you this cross because you know what? I have a scripture that goes along with this, okay? Because yeah. 
It doesn't look like all the other Valentines that you're probably used to getting, okay? But it says it represents Jesus' love for me. And the Bible says, I'm going to read it because this is a Bible verse. It's in the Bible. It says, greater love hath no man than this, that he would lay his life down for his friends. Okay? And that's just, just what Jesus did for me when he died on this cross. Okay? And that's why the cross, I believe, is the most beautiful valentine that I have ever received. And Jesus is the only one that has ever loved me enough to die for me. Okay? And so, do you think Jesus wants a valentine from us? Have you ever thought about yeah. giving Jesus a valentine? Yes. Yeah. You have? Okay. What do you think he wants? Do you think he wants something paper like that, Declan? Or do you think he wants something different? He wants something different. Yeah. What do you think he could want from us? He wants some paper with coloring. Oh, yeah. He could. We could give maybe him some paper and coloring. Isaiah, what about you? What do you think he wants oh. from us? Love. 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 And so what would that be? Given our what? heart to Jesus, right? Okay, so the way we show him that we love him is by giving our hearts to him, okay? And after all, he gave life for us, right? So I'm going to say a little prayer, and then I have something in here to help you guys remember, okay, that what we're supposed to give to Jesus for our Valentine, okay? So let's say a little prayer, and then instead of candy over here today, I have some uh, special candy in here, okay? says, Dear Lord, thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for us. As Jesus showed his love for us on that cross, may we now show our love for him by devoting our lives to serving him. Amen. Okay, so look what I have in here. I brought special for you guys. Remember how we're talking about giving our hearts? What do you think that is, Declan? A candy. Yeah, it's a candy, but what shape is it? It's a heart. So I'm going to let you guys get a couple of candy pieces out of here, okay, that you guys can get, okay? So do you want a couple bits? And then you guys can go on back. You want one to one? Here, you can have one to one. I'll trade you. You take that back. Okay, Coulter. Here we go. There you go, Declan. You can take more than one, Declan. Do you want more than one? I got enough to do more than one. Do you want one? For gathering him this morning is come thou fount of every blessing. Worship his majesty, page 30, United Methodist Hymnal, page 400. Please join me in the call to worship. 
Happy are those who are without blame. Blessed are those who walk in God's way. Happy are those who are faithful. Blessed are those who seek God. We will obey your word, O God. We will, we will praise you forever. And please join me in the opening prayer. Loving God, teach us your ways, lead us in your path, and guide us on our journey. Speak to us your words of life. For you will offer us direction. And us when we hear your voice and follow. Be near us each and every day. And bless us with your life. That our days may be fulfilled with grace. In Jesus' name. Our opening hymn is thy word is a lamp unto my feet. And it's in United Methodist Hymnal 601. may be seated. The epistle today comes from James chapter 4 verses 1 through 12. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust and the war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lust. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is an enemy with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy, but he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil of one another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaketh evil of the law and judges the law, but if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judges one another? This is the word of God to the people of God. Well, good morning. Can you hear me all right? All right. Well, uh, we've been doing this study at, at my church uh, through James, and uh, we're getting close to finishing it. And so uh, this is a message here that I preached here a few weeks ago. 
But uh, kind of the main point or thought on this is um, what you guys have on your bulletin today is the thought of drawing near to God, right? And as we think about that thought of drawing near to God, um, one thing I saw, want us to remember is, is in Hebrews 13, 8, it says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? And so Jesus can and will meet all of our needs that we need here, and our victory is found and is won in him. Um, because Jesus is the same today and forever, um, it's our sin nature, right, that kind of leads us and draws us away from Him. That's what I like about the book of James is you uh, really don't have to really think about it too much. It's kind of right there in your face, you know what I mean? He, he uh, just says, says it plain and clear. Um, as we think about these points that we're going to be drawing out of this, this passage today, um, in James, you'll see that it's the early Jewish Christians, right, that are scattered out abroad, right? And being that they were scattered out abroad, they would have been in different culture settings. They would have been surrounded by certain people that weren't believers. And uh, that's applicable to us today as well, right? So when we read the Word of God, I truly believe that there's nothing that we will experience in our lives that the Word of God cannot, cannot answer, right? And so... As we read these things, even though maybe the situations are not the same and different things are taking place, it's still applicable. As a believer in Christ, I, I have to go to work every day. I'm going to be surrounded by people that are not believers. And so, what's my testimony look like? Am I pointing people to Christ? Uh, because of my testimony, do people even want to see Christ? And so... So just as we think about that, those are some of the thoughts that I had there. And so as we're looking at this, we'll be breaking it up. We'll kind of look at um, two or three verses at a time and drawing our points out of each one of them. And so just to recap, um, just so it's fresh in your minds, uh, our first set of points will come out of verses 1 through 3. It says, from whence, wars, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that warn your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. And these first three verses in James 4, he's going to drill down the core issue, right, and what's going on. And he starts it in verse 1, the first part of verse 1. He creates that question from whence wars, uh, wars and fightings come from you. And that phrase, wars and fightings, is to say brawlings and quarrels and conflict. Um, there is a discussion as I was reading the commentaries and preparing for the message. Um, they think about this time would have been about the time that the Jewish Christians would have been getting ready to revolt against the Roman authorities at that time. Um, and uh, in Benson's commentary, he goes on to say that the crimes that were committed during this time, right, uh, in chapter 4 and chapter 5, what, what the people were experiencing were atrocious. But the thought that I wanted to try to grasp from that is, is, is not so much um, who, right, where these things are coming from, the people that are doing them, but the focus is, is where they're coming from, right? And James goes on to say where these problems are coming from in the second half of verse 1. He says, come they not hence, even of your lust, that war in your members. That word lust are to mean desires and cravings in your members, meaning within you. So it's our wants and desires, right? Our sin nature. And so in James, in this first verse, he cuts right to the point, it's within you that is to blame for the wars and, and fightings among you. As mentioned a minute ago, it's our sinful, our, our sinful nature, our desire for our pride, power to lift ourselves up, uh, to glorify us instead of glorifying God. And I believe if you drill this down, any unjustified war that's ever been started comes from this point, comes from this point of pride, a self-worth of 
of want and greed that uh, that people can struggle with. And so we'll look at verses 2 and 3 together. It says, Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. In verse 2, um, ye lust and have not, Barnes describes it as this, in his commentary, he says, that is, you wish to have something which you do not now possess and to which you have no just claim for it. And this prompts to the effort to obtain it by force. The next phrase, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, is to basically say you have a murderous spirit. A spirit or an attitude that wants what we can't have there's no way to obtain it other than by taking it by force, right? And so, um, and so as I was thinking about this and what he's talking about, what's going on in that time, um, are we seeing a common trait here? Um, is it about what one wants, no matter the cost? Um, the thought on that was, is does that not describe our culture today, right now? It doesn't matter, right? We want it. We feel entitled to it. I'm not saying we as individuals per se, but, but there's a movement of that, of people feeling entitled to uh, whatever they want. And so um, I would like us to look at verse, the end of verse 2 and verse 3 together. It says, Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. The main point is we are going to receive it one. Are we going to receive it when our hearts are not aligned with what the Word of God says? Um, we want what we want instead of seeking God first. Um, instead of seeking what He wants for us. If you look at some of those key phrases in that passage right there, it says, Ye lust, ye kill, ye fight in war, ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. As I was thinking about that, do we see anything in there, in that phrase, that, that would lead us to think that God would bless it or God would desire to bless it for us, right? It, it's all about what we want. Um, so, application for the first three verses um, is one should realize that, uh, that we as people, as mankind, we have a sin nature and that we live and are living in a broken world because of that sin nature, right? We should be mindful of our desires that we have in our lives. One, do they honor and glorify God? Or, or what is in there, in, in our desires, that, that might line up with some of the areas that James was mentioning here in these first three verses? Next application is, is our prayer time. Do we talk to God, right? Um, when and if we do, uh, does it look like, uh, what does it look like? Is it one-sided, where it's just me, 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 what I want? Or does it include seeking God, His leadership and guidance and direction in our lives? And then last thought is we serve a perfect, holy, and just God. And if you read the Word of God from front to back, it is, it shows His love to us completely through the whole Word of God. Um, and His desire is a desire, <clears throat> excuse me, for one to put their faith and trust in Christ. And so, being that He was willing to send Christ to the cross for the sins of the world, we can be confident that when we go to Him in prayer, that he will take care of the needs that we need here and now and that through him victory is won. The next uh, set of points will come through verses 4 through 6. It says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain that the spirit dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace unto the humble. 
In verse 4, James starts out by addressing the readers in this text as ye adulterers and adulteresses. Barnes explains it like this in his commentary. It says, these words are frequently used to denote those who are faithless towards God and are frequently applied to those who forsake God for idols. In his commentary, he gives a reference of Hosea 3, chapter 3, verse 1, just in case you want to look at it later. But the thought is, the main thought on this is, is as he's saying that is, you in effect have broken your marriage covenant with God by loving the world more than him. And once again, I was, as I was reading this, I, I try to think about kind of what's going on uh, in our lives and around us. And uh, it's something that we see in the world today. I think even more prevalent is, uh, and I had this thought as I was thinking about it, this percentage that I'm going to give you, I looked it up a long time ago, and so it might not be quite as accurate as what it was. But at one time, I was thinking that 70 to 80 percent of the, the people in the United States said that they believed in God, uh, they believed in Christianity, right? And so I started thinking about that. And so if you look at the stuff that the United States produces in music and in television shows and things like that, um, a, a lot of it goes against what the Word of God says. I'd say the majority of it. And so, which creates the thought. You got 70 to 80 percent that say they're Christians, right? If you, um, we got a group of guys that go around and do door knocking and, and most of the people that we come to say, oh yeah, I believe, you know, I believe in God. But the thought is, if 70 to 80 percent are believers in Christ, in order for that stuff to make money, you got to have consumers, right? And so just sometime, just turn on your TV or turn on just a secular radio station and just listen to what they're talking about, right? It gives you a good, a good evidence of, of the amount of consumers that are out there, right? And uh, with the thought being that as a believer, we'll get into it here in a minute, but as a believer, there should be a difference between the world and a person that claims Christianity. Even though the person that claims Christianity is not going to be perfect, we're not talking about perfection, because we're not going to receive, uh, we will not be perfect on this side of heaven, but uh, there should be a desire, a heart. And so, um, to go on, then James and the rest of the passage goes on to make a pretty profound statement. I think it's crucial for the believer and the unbeliever to understand that. Um, too many times we get caught up on political differences and stuff like that. But eternally, there's only two groups. There's the believer and the unbeliever, right? When it all boils down, there's going to be people that are going to heaven and people that are not going to heaven. And he says, Know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoso therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. I did a lot of looking up in that phrase, the world. And what I came up with, this is in my own words, I'm not quoting, but it says, um, is to say things that go against the word of God, right? And anything that removes God out of it and places it before God, right? That's kind of what, what I'm talking about when uh, the world. And so if you look at the first three verses that we looked at, their hearts were not aligned with God. The things that they were engaged in were not honoring and glorifying to God. And so James finishes verse 4 with a pretty stern statement. Um, the phrase, uh, that phrase, Who, whosoever will, that phrase means uh, purpose and intent. Uh, um, meaning their heart was set on being a friend of the world. And so uh, this is a clear and called out warning, I believe, in the Word of God anywhere, uh, for at that point in time and today that if anyone purposes or anyone has intention, that means that they're focused on um, and it's all about the world, God says that they are an enemy of God. Which creates the question right now, <clears throat> Excuse me. Whenever I read this, I always like to ask, uh, what's, what might be in my life 
that doesn't line up with the Word of God, right? Um, at some point, we all struggle with that, right? We're not perfect. Um, um, or maybe there's something that might completely remove him out of it. Um, uh, right now, there is a movement. Um, um, I'm glad to hear about that in Asbury. I hadn't heard that yet, but I mean, that's encouragement, encouraging. But there is another movement that's popular with the youth today. Um, I haven't done a whole deep study on it, but it is a movement of, uh, I wouldn't say radical Christianity, but it's not that. It's, it's another name. I can't think of it right now, but the basically driver of it is, is that there's no sin, right? There's no sin. God created me how I am, so which means he created me sinful. And it's a mindset that, that basically God will be good with me because I can come to God as I am. And the scary part of that is, is there's no concern of judgment there, right? Um, and so I believe that you see this in the world right now, you know. Well, God created me like this, and I just like what I want. You know, no big deal. But that there, there's a, should be a difference, right? Between what uh, there is sin, God's word calls it sin, and uh, we should look at it that way. Um, verse five, it says, "Do you think the Scripture saith in vain that the Spirit dwelleth in us? Lusteth the envy, but He giveth more grace. Wherefore He saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble." Uh, thought on verse 5 is God gave us a spirit when he created man, right? Um, God's desire for us is, is that we would seek him over the things of the world, right? Um, the spirit that, uh, that we have um, without the Holy Spirit, without being saved, um, we struggle with sin, right? Um, we will um, throughout this uh, throughout our fleshly lives struggle with worldly things but in um, John 23 or chapter 4 verses 23 and 24 it says but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth for the Father seeketh uh, such to worship him God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth which creates another thought as I'm reading this is, is deep down in who we are, right? Right now, if you're just being honest with yourself and God, right? Nobody else knows. Do we really, does one really truly desire to worship God? Um, or do we desire other things? Um, I definitely have had those, those battles in my life. There's, there's times where I, I, I would much rather be hunting and fishing than sitting in church. You know what I mean? Um, so it, it's just a thought for you to think about as you're, as you're thinking about that. Deep down, do you really want God? You know? Do you want to worship Him? In verse 6, uh, uh, Three things that I want us to look at. First is grace comes from God, and it is defined as unmerited favor of God towards man. As much as we think that and love our loved ones and ourselves, um, we are not deserving of God's grace, right? Uh, we're sinners. Verse 6 tells us that God resists the proud, meaning... Um, well, when a person's proud, they don't have a uh, they don't have a, a sense of regret for for the sin in their lives or or what the sin cost Jesus on the cross. Um, uh, you have a proud heart. Um, and thirdly, we see we receive grace from God if we have a humble spirit. Right. That means um, to have a humble spirit. I believe would mean that um, we understand that we're a sinner saved by grace that simple you know and I can't earn it I can't obtain it in myself and uh, and and that we're thankful as much as we can be here in the flesh of God sending his only son to die on the cross for our sins application for us um, <coughs> is there anything in our lives as mentioned earlier that you desire more than God right sitting here in the church as you're reading your word of God is there things that you that you might struggle with, that you'd rather be doing, but you're doing this because you know that you, that you should be here. Um, 
Are we appreciative of the grace that we have received as believers? Um, I mean, if this is something that you're unsure of, I'm sure that there's many men, I, I, I would have no problem doing it, that would be willing to sit down and, and point you to the grace that we see in Christ by putting our faith and trust in Him. And so as we finish up these next verses, um, verses 7 through 12 will kind of be like application points, right, for us. And so verse 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And verse 7, that word to submit means to be under God's control um, or obey. We are to be committed to God. Um, if we desire God and are focused on Him, I believe that there should be a separation between, um, per se, the world and the kingdom, right? Um, there should be a desire to be in His Word, a desire to be surrounded by fellow believers, sitting in His house, sitting under the preaching of the Word of God, and, uh, and prayer time all creates these boundaries between you and the world, I believe. I believe that if there is boundaries that we implement, um, that God's Word tells us that we should be doing, that the next point out of that passage will be easier on us, and that is, it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. To resist the devil, I believe, um, you'd have to look at one's heart, right? We mentioned this earlier. Is that heart focused and committed to God? Or is that person trying to have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. Um, um, this is a personal decision I believe one has to make. One that is in total submission to God and, and His will. Uh, they won't be perfect, but I, I believe they'll have a sense of conviction if they do struggle in certain areas, and it will be harder for the devil to make them <clears throat> stumble when they do um, because... Um, if you're seeking the Lord and then you fail in some way, and we do in thought, word, or deed, um, there's a sense of wrongness that comes from that, a sense of a desire to confess it to the Lord and ask for forgiveness. The one that is straddling the fence per se, uh, one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom, there is a struggle because uh, they do not see what the sin cost. Christ, right? Um, and because they are straddling that fence, they're going to be influenced by more things of the world because they're going to be surrounded by it. Um, and uh, I've heard many pastors say that the most miserable people in the world is a person that is, says that they're a believer and then they try to walk both sides of the fence. You know what I mean? They try to take the world and God and mix them together and it don't work. It's like trying to mix oil and water. You know what I mean? There's just an automatic separation there. Verse 8 says, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinner, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Um, verse 8, we see, uh, If we will draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to us. Um, this statement creates the question, If anyone says that they want God, um, are you willing to come to him open, right? Allowing him to have full access to your life. Because um, I believe if, if you're holding on to something of the world, um, that you're not going to be able to have that closeness because you're going to come to Jesus and you're going to say, I want you, but, you know, you can have three quarters of my heart, but, you know, stay out of this one little area. This is where I like to go and do whatever I want to do. And, and uh, so the thought is, is can you really draw close to God if you're not just coming to him openly, right? Um, basically saying, here I am, a sinner, I need you. Um, willingly to commit, uh, completely submit to him. Um, I would also say that there is a growth, right? As you draw close to God, um, the Holy Spirit, once you're saved, the Holy Spirit will bring things to your mind. You know what I mean? Um, it's hard to understand how bad your sin is before you're saved. But um, as you're saved, as you read the word to God, and the Holy Spirit will start to lead and convict, and it will bring things to your mind. Um, and uh, 
there becomes a want and a desire to be more Christ-like. I remember when I went to church camp and I went down and, and uh, had asked the Lord to save me. I knew that I was eventually going to learn more about God, but at that point in time, I was letting him have complete access to my heart. You know what I mean? Like, here I am. You know, I want you, no matter what it is. Um, wherever you lead me. Uh, verse 8 says, Cleanse your hands, ye sinner, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. As you read this passage, James seems to be directing this certain to a certain type of people. Um, ye double-minded is to say people that are unstable, constantly being between, between the world and God, as mentioned earlier. Not believing, I believe it creates a mindset of not believing God will and can provide all that they need currently. So it creates a uh, tug and pull, uh, uh, tug of war type situation. Or we are uh, kind of looking at this verse in, in reverse, but um, I wanted to say that the people James is addressing, to, but to cleanse one hands, to purify their hearts, is to simply say to lead a pure life. And the only way that we can be cleansed um, and have our sins removed is by putting our faith and trust in Christ. In verse 9, we see descriptions of what our sin should cause us to do, right? It says, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Um, James, I believe, gives an example of um, a, uh, the people that he's talking to, their mentality of their sins and their wicked ways. He says, let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to heaviness. Um, in this phrase, it does not seem that there was any kind of sorrow for their ways. Um, and I was thinking about this. How many times have we been in a work setting? Been more, I've been in a factory setting for, <laughs> for uh, probably 25 to 30 years of my life. And, and how many times have I got wrapped up into, um, you know, sinful things that just take place in the work, work setting where I should have just been neutral and not went along with anything, but you hear somebody say something and you end up laughing about it and you shouldn't be, you know what I mean? There's definitely a struggle there. Um, the thought on that is, is do we not know that people that are in their sin that is not covered by the shed blood of Jesus Christ will be judged. Um, that thought is convicting for me because I still got one of my parents that I'm not for sure if they are saved or not. Um, and so <clears throat> that thought that a person will eventually be judged if they're not saved, it won't matter if it's our parents, it won't matter if it's a sibling, a best friend, a stranger walking down the street, there will be judgment. Um, and then James tells us that our, shin, or that our sin should afflict us, meaning it should make us miserable. It should cause one to be upset. Um, uh, that word mourn in the Greek is to say deep grief or intense sorrow, openly manifested by weeping, which created the question, when was the last time that I weeped over the sin that was in my life? How, when did it bother me? Verse 10 says, uh, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Um, basically realizing that, that uh, there's nothing special about yourself. You're a sinner, um, saved by the grace of God. And uh, it says that he shall lift you up. Um, I would say that there's no better place for the believer to be is in a sense of humility uh, before an almighty God. And then as we come to a close, verses 11 and 12 um, kind of reflects our actions and our walks. It kind of affects others that we come in contact with. It says, Speak not evil of one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art a doer of the law. Uh, not, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? James gives us two things to be mindful of. One is speak not evil one of another. We shouldn't speak evil of, a, of anybody. Um, 
not only it shouldn't happen in the church, but it shouldn't happen after we walk outside of the walls of the church, right? Um, don't say mean things, bad or against another person. Second is judging uh, his brother. <clears throat> Matthew Poole's commentary explained it as finding fault with and condemns him for the things which the law doth not condemn him for or forbid him to. So if we do this, we're speaking evil of the law, and to judge his brother is to judge the law. And that phrase, the law, in 11 and 12, um, after I studied and read multiple commentaries, it's mentioning of the law that uh, Jesus gives in 22 verses 37 through 40 where it says that we're supposed to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, so I'd just like to leave you with a few thoughts on these two verses as we come to a close. Um, when we fail to love others, we, breaking, we are breaking God's law. We are to love our neighbors as ourselves. Um, that is anyone and everyone that we come in contact with. And this should cause us to think of our mindset and our actions to others. Do we build people up or do we break them down? Um, um, we should have a good testimony and point them to Christ. And so as we leave today, um, the final thought is, is let's have a heart that desires to draw close to the Lord, to acknowledge the sin that's in our life, and, and that hates the sin that's in our life, and uh, to point people to Christ. And so that's all I have for you. Yeah, it's kind of a longer message, so i got to run now. So. Thank you, Jason. Yep. Uh, Now that you've heard the word, is there any concerns we can bring before the congregation? <clears throat> we'll go to prayer in the Lord then. Heavenly Father, we come before you today to ask for healing for Joanne. Please help her in her time of need that she come through surgery. Please do this in Jesus' name who taught us the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We'll have our offering.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for these blessings, and we ask that you let us put it to good use for our ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn is Trust and Obey and Worship His Majesty, page 586 in United Methodist Hymnal 467. receive the benediction. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. Are you looking for a church family, some place that you can call home? Well, consider joining our Ebenezer family. There's uh, no dress code at Ebenezer. We welcome the person and we don't worry about uh, what you're wearing. The dress is mostly going to be country casual. Uh, if you want to wear your Sunday best though, please do so. Uh, but if you're on your way in from work or headed to work, uh, just stop on in. The only suggestion that we have is if you've been out working the cattle, uh, please uh, scrape your boots and clean them off before you come in the building. 
We have weekly opportunities to worship and to uh, be in fellowship with uh, the others at the church building. Uh, Sunday worship begins at 9 a.m. in the sanctuary. And then following our Sunday worship, we have Sunday school where we have classes for all ages starting at 1025. The adults meet out in the fellowship hall while the youth meet in the sanctuary and in the classrooms that are behind our sanctuary. If you are looking to get closer uh, to God through his word and learn more about the Bible, have we got a deal for you. On Monday nights at 6.30 in our fellowship hall, we have a Bible study that is led by Merle and Joan Rothwell. And in this Bible study, they go through the Word of God. They go through the book, then they go through it verse by verse and chapter by chapter. And Merle and Joan have studied underneath uh, rabbis and the Jewish, and so they understand some of the Jewish traditions in a way that some of us uh, as Christians have never heard before. So come and join that Bible study and learn more about what the Old Testament has to say and what the New Testament has to say for us Christian believers. On Tuesdays, the, in cooperation with the Little White Church down in Olpe, we have an opportunity for the kids during the school year uh, to go to All God's Children. All God's Children starts at 335 uh, and ends about 445. They need you to come pick the kids up then. But uh, it is a great time for the kids to, uh, to learn more about God. Then on Wednesday nights for our youth uh, from junior high age to uh, high school, the high school youth group meets, or the, or the uh, Ebenezer youth group meets, and they meet at 7 p.m. out in the fellowship hall. We also have some monthly opportunities. Our ladies uh, meet on the third Tuesday of every month. And they have fellowship together. So if you'd like to learn more about the Bible and hang out with the ladies, uh, well, come on out and join the ladies at 6.30 p.m. on the third Tuesday of the month. The guys, well, anytime that we're involved, we have to have breakfast. And so there's a breakfast for the guys. Uh, we start breakfast at 8 a.m. on the third Saturday of the month. And then after the breakfast, which normally finishes up about 8.30, we go ahead and have a short devotion. We're out of there by 9 o'clock so that you can go on and continue on with your day's activities. Uh, so uh, go ahead and come out and join us uh, for the men's breakfast, if you like. The church is located four and a half miles west of Olpe on Road 70. And so if you want to come out, just leave Opie headed west and you'll go off the gravel, off the paved road a little bit, off on the gravel, and then you'll be uh, see the church on the north side or the right-hand side of the road as you're coming out from Opie. We would really like to ask that God bless you exceedingly and abundantly, and we sure hope that you'll consider coming out and taking a look at Ebenezer Church, visiting us, and maybe becoming part of our family. So we sure hope to see you soon. God bless.